probably going to give it to 605 because people are still heading into the waiting room. Thank you all for coming. And everyone, because we have such a large group here, 40 participants so far, um, is going to be muted to start unless I've um, unmuted, muted some of the core team. Um, basically what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go over, you know, introductions, ground rules, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we're gonna have the presentation and then, um, we can ask questions by chat and then we'll open it up to regular questions uh, after we get through the chat questions. Uh, if you're having any tech questions with your computer at home, I cannot help you because <laughs> I don't know what you have, like poor Kelly who runs the Black River Action Team. All right, looks like Uh, there's no one in the, been in the waiting room for at least 30 seconds or so, so let's get rolling. Um, my name is Pete Fellows. I work for Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission, which is, uh, for those of you who aren't Vermonters, kind of a county government equivalent. And we help our member communities do all sorts of things. Um, we participate in all sorts of different planning activities. In particular, this one is uh, basin planning or watershed planning. We uh, helped um, the owners, the current owners of the uh, Amherst Lake Dam get a state watershed grant to study their dam. And this is kind of the last component of that grant, basically going over the finished report from the grant and uh, having a meeting about it where uh, folks can participate and ask questions. So that's what we're here to do tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, uh, I wanna remind you that uh, the O'Laughlins, they're here. Uh, they own the dam and the dam is privately owned. Uh, Amherst Lake is a natural lake where we detect the dam entirely uh, away, the lake would still exist as a natural lake. And once we get into the report, uh, we'll talk about this. This is a preliminary report. It's at what's known as the screening level, and it only delineates rough costs. So, but uh, the report author, Matt Murawski, PE, will talk about that when he goes over the report. Okay. Um, now, I want to introduce everyone in um, who's uh, part of the core team here. We have uh, Mike and Deb O'Laughlin, who are the private dam owners. They're waving. We have Matt Murawski. He is the engineer who completed the report. Hello. Uh, we also have uh, a couple folks uh, from the state of Vermont. Uh, Marie Caduto, she's a basin planner. We also have, she's waving. We also have uh, someone um, who popped on from somewhere. I got an email. Where do I see her name? Uh, I can't remember her. Heather Pembroke. Uh, Heather Pembroke. Thank you, Todd. Um, she's here. We also have Todd Meniz, who is a, a river engineer and river scientist for the state of Vermont. He just waved. He's been involved uh, intimately with this project. And we have um, Senator Alice Nitka. She's on uh, the line. Uh, uh, two Plymouth Select Board members, they're also on the line. So I think we're pretty well represented uh, by, you know, government folks and state officials. Let's see if I'm, my boxes here are hiding people. I think that's about it. My, my work colleague here 
is also here, Sage Doviak. She may be helping me with uh, some uh, chat things once we get rolling into questions. And then we have, um, who else did I see? Oh, of course we have uh, Kelly uh, Stetner who's with the Black River Action Team. So she's kind of the watershed wide um, volunteer coordinator for all things Black River Watershed. She participated in this project by securing um, some assistance with drone footage and helped Matt with uh, a lot of little things as well as doing some initial invasives monitoring on the project with uh, looking at some of the Phragmites growth. You Over got there. somebody looking to get into the meeting. Yep. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> um, so that's uh, all the people. And next, um, let me. So the next thing we're going to do, um, if no one has any questions right before we get rolling. If you do, stick them in the chat. Matt's going to take about 15 to 20 minutes to go over to the report. Um, and then you, as he's talking, if you have a question that pops into your head, just put it in the chat and we'll collate those and then we'll feed them back to Matt. After we finish that process, we will uh, open it up for questions. The copy of the report will be uh, I'll make it available in the chat for download after this, and uh, you can request it from me, and I can email it out um, to the participants as well. You got another one waiting in the room. Okay, waiting. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm checking, Todd. I'll get them as they come. <laughs> I'm gonna give it to Matt to take it away um, and go over the report. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, and I'll share my screen here in a moment and show some pictures and some tables. Uh, but first let's give you just a general overview. We call this a screening level review, which means we didn't dig into great detail in terms of the design of any one or, or, or two or three solutions. We looked at them sort of in more, um, in broader terms. Um, and, and we looked at what the impacts of different solutions would be in broader terms. Um, and for any one of the things we looked at, and we looked at full restoration of this dam, we looked at partial restoration of it, and we also looked at removal. And for any one of those alternatives, more work would need to be done. But this, what we tried to do here in this initial effort um, is to uh, uh, put some ballpark costs together, um, some general descriptions of what the solutions would look like and, and um, what the pros and cons of those solutions are. Um, so with that, let me share my screen. I'm going to start off to, just with some pictures um, uh, that hopefully get us all on, on common footing here. Can you see my screen here showing these pictures? I can. It looks good. Okay, so I'll go through just a handful of these, these quickly. And these are all straight out of the report that Pete will make available after. This is standing on the left bank, looking uh, left, left looking downstream um, uh, across the dam. Uh, this is taken from this summer. So the flashboards were already removed. And so you're looking at water flowing over the concrete crest of this dam, uh, flowing from right to left in the picture. Um, uh, before this summer, Every, every year there used to be uh, flashboards, pieces of wood put up across the, um, that concrete spillway that held the water up. Most recently, those flashboards held the water up two feet. And you can kind of see the staining on the concrete that shows where that old water level used to be on that far wall over there. Um, uh, so most recently, those flashboards held the water up about two feet. And in, in some years past, the water was held up as high as three feet. Um, and so many of you were used to that water level being up at least two feet higher than it is in, in these pictures and than it is uh, today. Uh, uh, so just to give you a quick orientation of what we have here, we have this main spillway with a concrete crest there, and that's a, about 78 feet across. And then over on that far side over there, there's another little four foot section between that far wall and this other smaller wall. And that four foot section has what's called a gate. And it means it's a, it, just as a, a farm gate, you can open it up to let things out. A gate on a dam, you open it up to let water out. So there's a four foot gate um, 
uh, over there. And up on the top here, there's some apparatus there that you would use to, to crank the gate um, open his, historically. Um, um, keep on scrolling through some other pictures. This is standing downstream, looking back up to where that previous photo was taken. Um, so there again, you can see the concrete crest. Um, water drops over that and then continues down into Echo Lake. Uh, that wall on the side is what's known as a, as a training wall. It sort of trains the water where you want it to go. Um, uh, looking across to the far uh, wall. And here you can really see a lot of uh, some of the, you can see a lot of the concrete issues that the structural issues that face this dam right now. You can see all that, that white um, concrete. Concrete's really rotten there. It's in really significantly poor shape. Tough to tell from this photo, but it's completely undermined at the bottom here. It's, it's in um, remarkably bad shape. Uh, more undermining of this, this smaller stem wall right here. Um, you can see a block of concrete that was placed um, here because there was undermining of the spillway itself. If you were to go out as the state has done and probe with a stick underneath this concrete spillway, you'd find that there are voids underneath it is not supported well. Um, the dam's in rough shape. The state, um, uh, and I'll pause here for a moment to talk about uh, the, the, the state's role in this. While the dam is privately owned, um, it, it uh, forms a lake that holds enough water that it, it, it is regulated by the state of Vermont um, dam safety program. Um, uh, for a dam like this, they inspect it periodically and this, for this kind of a dam, typically every two years and they report on its condition. Um, and uh, they did that most, they did it in, in recent years, they did it in 2019 and again in 2021, and the dam is in poor condition um, uh, because of these things that I pointed out, such uh, as the, the, um, uh, the rotten concrete, the undermined walls. Um, those walls are in fact leaning also, they're slowly tilting in toward the channel. This is over on what was the far side in those other pictures. And there you can see that concrete that I said got placed to address some undermining of the slab. Um, you can see the backside of the gate right here and this vertical piece right there as part of the operator. If you're up on the top, you could crank that and, and open or close the gate. And, and when, you did, when you do that, water would drop below the level of the spillway and all be, as long as you don't have, as long as you're just in low flow conditions, the water would shoot through this gate area. Um, rather than going over the spillway. Um, here you can see some of that rotten concrete that I talked about. Um, here, if you look closely, you can see uh, that, that used to be concrete. Now what's left are, are pieces of exposed, um, corroded steel reinforcement. Um, so it's, it's hardly a wall even at this downstream end. So the state has classified this in poor condition and it's really, um, uh, I would say it's not debatable. It's in, it's in poor condition. Um, and I'll, I'll pause for a moment here while we're looking at this to talk also about how the state categorizes dams. Uh, dams are, are categorized, because not all dams are created, created equal from a safety perspective. And the dam safety, it's in their name, the dam safety um, section at the department at the, at the state is, is they're, 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 they're um, charged with um, uh, uh, trying to, make, to um, ensure that dams, whether privately owned or state owned or municipally owned are um, safe and not posing a hazard um, to the downstream communities should the dams fail. And so you can imagine if you had a very small dam that was not holding back much water, it, it, it's possible a dam like that could fail and do no harm. In which case the state would say that's a low hazard dam because the consequences of it failing um, uh, don't amount to much. There's not much property damage or risk to life. Um, but then you can imagine a larger dam where if it failed, maybe it takes out some roads, potentially it floods houses. Well, now maybe we're, now we're in the category, the middle category is significant hazard. And then uh, one more hazard classification where if it fails, loss of, uh, there's probable loss of life and that would make something high hazard. This dam, the state has classified it as significant hazard. Um, uh, and in the work that I did in this report, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on that on this, this um, presentation here, but uh, in the report you'll see it, it was it's a screening level evaluation um, that suggests that the significant hazard, that middle category, is indeed the correct hazard classification for this dam. Were the dam to fail, there's likely to be some houses, um, or camps down below that would be um, 
flooded. Uh, and, and with that comes the potential for loss of life. So a significant hazard, at least significant hazard is likely warranted for the dam. A few more photos. This, uh, again, you can see that the concrete in poor condition consistently. You can see along the crest of the spillway here where there's catching a little bit of woody debris, there are little, little grass and such and leaves. That's where there used to be steel rods that stuck up to hold the flashboards in place. And uh, this, the state in, in earlier in this, or last year now, 2021, um, uh, after inspecting it again, confirming it was in poor condition, um, uh, developed what, what they called a water control plan, which was a, a sort of an interim measure to reduce the risk of damage should the dam fail. And the main piece of that was to cut off those metal supports that used to be across there, um, thereby permanently removing the flashboards that held the water up higher. And so now should the dam fail, uh, uh, there's not as much water that would go downstream. Um, so there's not as much risk to downstream um, property or people. Um, this is the, uh, this is a, uh, on the Black River on the inlet side of the lake, um, you can see the exposed ground on the far bank there. Before the flashboards came out, this area was, uh, uh, would have been inundated, would have, would have been a lake, sort of a linear section of lake. Now with the flashboards out, this is sort of the head of the Black, Black River now uh, where it's free flowing and going into the now lower lake level. Um, this is a picture of a, of a typical um, dock around the shore when the flashboards came out. Again, the flashboards came out lowering the water about two feet. Typically on most of the lake, the, the edge of water retreated something on the order of six to 10 feet or so. It's really steep. The banks of this, of this lake are um, on at least three sides, downstream and both sides of it are very steep. And so when the water level goes down, um, it doesn't, you don't have vast expanses of land exposed, at least for the first two feet of drawdown, that's the case. Okay, so those were the photos there. Um, let me switch to, uh, let's talk about the, the, the uh, uh, different alternatives. So let me go back to some of those photos there since they're more interesting than just me. Okay, so um, there are really three Three alternatives here. Uh, you know, before I talk about the alternatives, let me just first talk about ownership for a moment. Um, the dam is privately owned, as are many, many dams throughout Vermont and throughout New England. Um, this dam was built in the 1950s, um, replacing an old timber dam that was once there. It was uh, um, uh, Central Vermont Public Service. Um, do I have that? I think I have that correct. Who originally um, or built it in 1950? They built it to. to um, try to control flows downstream so that they could better uh, generate um, um, electricity. Turns out it, it didn't work as they really hoped and they, they no longer wanted it and sold it sometime in the 1980s. Um, much more recently, the, uh, the current owners um, purchased it and the current owners have actively been working with dam safety to try to um, uh, address the dam, to try to come up with what the solutions are. Um, they've invested, uh, uh, thousands of dollars at this point in doing what would have been very basic preventative maintenance over the years had it been done and it wasn't done. Um, so things like clearing small trees, the roots of which were uh, causing the, the, the walls to rotate, those were never cleared. And so the owners, instead of clearing small brush, were the current owners instead um, uh, spent considerable funds removing large trees. So um, uh, uh, dam ownership if it's privately owned, the onus, the onus is on the, those private owners to maintain it over time. Um, many dams like this one were not very well maintained. So uh, uh, the current owners um, uh, have been working with dam safety to try to understand what the options are for moving forward. Um, and there is, I should, I'll, I'll, start, I'll say this from the very onset, there um, for privately owned dams, there is no public money available for rehabilitation for maintenance, um, for reconstruction, um, that burden is 100% on the owners of the dam. Um, in contrast, removing dams, because you can make a case that it's ecological restoration, that it restores fish passage, and that there can be 
water quality benefits, there is state and federal money available for um, removing dams. So three options when you have a dam like this. And for the, for the, for the time being, let's, let's uh, 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 forget about who's gonna pay for it. Let's just talk about the three options. Three options are um, uh, full restoration, bring this dam up to current state standards, repair all this concrete, make sure it has adequate hydraulic capacity so it can pass enough water. Um, in this case, full restoration would be bringing the water level up two to three feet back where it used to be, where everyone was used to it being, where it worked well for the docks and that sort of thing. That's full restoration. Partial restoration would be leaving the water level where it is today, where it is in that photograph. Um, uh, and then doing all the repairs to um, the concrete. Um, and then the final option would be uh, removal. And removal would be removing all of the man-made features that you see in this photograph and restoring a natural channel between um, uh, Amherst Lake and Echo Lake down below. Okay, let's, um, um, so those are the three options, full rehab, partial rehab, and removal. And Pete, let me know if I'm dragging on too long here I'll, and I'll speed things up. No, we're, we're doing great. You okay. got maybe another 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so let's go to uh, full restoration. So full restoration, again, is bringing the water level back up to where it uh, was during at least the summertime periods. And looking at that water stain on this wall over here, you can kind of see it. That corresponds to the exposed rock on the banks all the way um, around uh, the lake. Um, if we were to look at aerial photographs of, let's see if I can get to it here. Moment. So if we were to look at an aerial photograph of the lake here, down at the bottom of my screen here, you can see Echo Lake, the channel between Echo and Amherst. And here, of course, is Amherst Lake. And you can, you can get a clear sense of where the, the lake boundaries are. So full restoration would put it back to what's shown in this photograph, which is a full water level that most of you are uh, familiar with. Um, uh, to get that water level up higher, uh, we have to do something to hold the water up. Um, uh, dam industry standards for dam safety and state, reg state requirements won't allow us to use flashboards anymore. Those old wooden boards that were across the dam, they're not allowed because they are uh, generally thought to be and shown to be unreliable. They fail when they're not supposed to fail. So there can be waves of water um, going downstream, having negative impacts and, and, and risk to property and people. So flashboards are not allowed. So instead, the solution would leave the existing crest where it is and place new concrete. You can imagine a new concrete wall going all the way across um, the spillway. That's how we would get the water back up. So a new concrete wall on top of that spillway uh, that's two to three feet high. Um, and then we have all this rotten concrete to deal with. We also have, if you go over to this corner here, you'll find that it's terribly undermined. So we have a lot of, a lot, a lot of just repair of these walls to do. Um, that would involve uh, um, uh, doing some temporary damming so we can have the water stay on one side of the dam while we work on, on the dry side. And then we kick the water to the other side and work over there. And we repair or replace these concrete walls. Um, uh, it would involve re replacing this gate uh, um, area here, um, and you'll see in the report I've suggested a different way of doing it besides this, this wall, a different way that would just give us less concrete that needs to be maintained over time. Um, in, the, in the design of, of this full restoration, we would need to evaluate whether the dam can handle all the water it needs to handle, um, and uh, uh, that may involve, in order to, when, when I say handle all the water it needs to handle, when we, when on dams, we look at really big storms. We look at um, uh, very big storms coming through. They're, they're uh, you know, much bigger than the hundred year storm event. We're talking uh, more, more like the thousand year storm event. Um, and we wanna make sure that water doesn't flow where we don't want it to flow. So in this case, we want all the water to go between our walls, not be flowing on, on ground over here where it might erode and have the, the 
lake drain around the side of our dam. So as part of full restoration, we would very likely um, need to raise these walls a bit to make sure that we had all the water going through our spillway. So again, the main component here, we're raising the crest by placing concrete, we're repairing all these walls and probably raising them and, and putting in a new gate here. So those are the main components of it. Um, uh, I'm going to refrain from cost and I'll give, well, I'll say, it. so the cost of a full restoration, I've estimated it at uh, $530,000. So that's a, that's, a, that's a screening level, a planning number, planning level number, $530,000 to do that. Um, and some of you may be looking at that and thinking, it's just concrete walls. What do we need 530,000 for? Uh, I can just tell you working on dams is exceedingly expensive. Um, there's so much effort that goes into controlling water and because of the, the risk to downstream properties and people, um, construction is held to a standard that is much, much higher than you would hold for even commercial real estate. So working on dams is very expensive. Okay, so that's full restoration, $530,000. Um, let's go to partial restoration. So again, partial restoration is we're still gonna have a dam. Um, we're still gonna have to repair all of these walls. We're still gonna need to put in a new gate over here. Um, so it's just, in, those, in that regard, it is just like full restoration. The difference is we are not going to raise uh, the crest of the dam any more than you see right here today. It's gonna stay with the water flowing over the crest of the dam. So it's full restoration, except we're not bringing the water level back up. We're keeping it where it is today, which is roughly two feet um, below where it was uh, last year. So what you see out there today, if you were to go drive around, if you, if you own docks on it, what you see today is what partial restoration would look like in terms of water level. Um, and let's pause right there and talk about what that water level kind of looks like. So again, it comes down about two feet, um, which means uh, the lake is not as deep as it was. Um, and I can tell you the dam uh, originally with the water at full pond level, where that water stain is, where the exposed rock is, um, Amherst Lake Dam was uh, 90 uh, feet deep. Um, which is remarkably deep. There are two deep pockets in there. The, deep, the deepest one is 90 feet. Um, uh, which uh, made it the 11th, it was tied uh, for the 11th deepest lake in the state. It's remarkably deep. When the water came down two feet, as it's shown in this picture and as it is today, um, it went from 90 feet deep to 88 feet deep. And um, it's now the 12th deepest lake um, in the state. The surface area um, went from uh, 82 acres to 80 acres. So we lost a it added up, those two acres come from almost entirely around the perimeter um, of the dam, or perimeter of the lake rather. That's where we lost our two acres when it came down. Um, that of course doesn't tell the whole story because those of you who are up, up on um, the inlet channel, for instance, or those who use um, the Hawk Marina there, while, while the shoreline didn't retreat too much, the depth sure changed. So, so uh, I wanna acknowledge that, that uh, um, there are impacts for sure. Okay. So um, we've talked about full removal, we've talked about, or I'm sorry, full restoration, we've talked about partial restoration, and now let's talk about removal, the third option. So the third option is we remove all these man-made components. Uh, we uh, reshape the, the ground where the dam is right now to look a lot like the, down, the channel that's downstream leading into Echo Lake. Um, these two lakes will still not be equal. We will still have a free-flowing channel. Hey, uh, hey, Matt. Can yeah. I cut in just for a Please. second? There's a couple questions in this chat that I did want to interrupt you for. They're both on the cost of partial restoration before oh. you go to removal. Thank you. Okay, so I said full restoration was 530. Um, partial restoration is 480. It's still awfully expensive. Again, the big thing that's not, the big difference here is that we're not adding the concrete. That's where the savings is. But it's still 480,000. Okay, um, back, back to removal here. So we would, the, right now the water level between this flat water on the right side of this picture and the channel downstream here is just a touch over three feet, 3.1 feet or so. So um, uh, that's the drop that we would have with full removal. We go, uh, this water up here would drop three feet down to this level right here. 
Under the footprint of the dam here, we would have a natural stream channel that looks a lot like the stream channel that's down below that if you were staying there now, you'd see going into Echo Lake. Um, so before we drop, with the flashboards off, we dropped it two feet. That would be the partial restoration. With the removal, we'll drop an additional three. So we're, I'm rounding my numbers here. So we were talking about a total drop of five feet from the historic levels. Um, I said that the going from the original water level to where it is today, uh, we dropped two feet from 90 feet to 88. So with this full, with the full removal, we're going from 88 down to 85 feet for maximum depth. That's still an awfully deep lake. Um, uh, I, I said that with the, at the current water level, we were tied, we were the 12th deepest lake in the, st in the state and um, taking it down another three feet, we're still the 12th deepest lake um, in the state um, at, at again, 85 feet. Next in line is uh, Lake St. Catherine at 65 feet. So we're, we're, we're still 20 feet deeper than the next um, deepest lake in the state. Uh, I, I bring that up because I, I know people have said we won't have, there will not be a Lake Amherst were, were the dam to come out. And that's, that's simply not the case. It'll change and there are some impacts, but there is still a remarkably deep lake left behind. Surface area changes more significantly. I said before that going from the original water level to the current one shrunk, we lost about two acres of lake, mostly along the shoreline. Um, uh, it's, it's more significant when we take out these remaining three feet, if we remove the dam. We went from originally original 82 acres down, down to 80 acres. Um, we go down to 64 acres with full removal. There's still not a lot of change in shoreline along the sides of the dam. Let me find the photo here. That was a, a typical side, uh, side of the lake rather. So again, this, this lake is, in almost all places, it's very steep along the banks here. So even when we drop the water another three feet, uh, we don't have a, a, um, a, a massive retreat of the shoreline. We have something 10 to 20 foot retreat of the shoreline with the additional three feet. So um, does that mean that docks don't work? Probably, they need to be relocated, um, but that's doable. Uh, uh, landowners along these shorelines here gain some additional, it's cobbly, it's not really sandy in most places, but they gain some additional beach, but over time would green up. Um, um, and I should add here, I, I went around with, with uh, Todd Meniz from Agency of Natural Resources. We, we canoed around the perimeter of this with a, um, with a sonar device that measured the depth of the lake, and that's how we developed where these new shorelines would be located by taking thousands of, of depth soundings around the entire uh, perimeter of the lake. Um, let me grab. Okay, you got about a couple minutes left, Matt, okay, and then perfect. we're gonna switch to so, questions. Okay, so uh, um, these lines here, you can see that in the, in the photograph here where the original, we can see where the water is, and that's the original water level. There's that first dotted line. You can, let me zoom in a bit. Well, first I want to just point out overall, these lines represent two foot drawdowns in water level. So the first dotted line there is two foot drawdown from the where the, line, where the shore would be located um, if we took the water down two feet. So um, that's where it's located today because that's about what we took it down, two feet. The next line, light blue represents taking it down another two feet. And the, the um, interior line represents taking it down an additional. So full removal, is going to be somewhere between that light blue line and the interior uh, line. So up in this upper area here, this is where the Hawk Marina is. This is where the, the boat ramp is. This is where with full removal, we lose our acreage. I said we went from 80 acres to 64 acres and the vast bulk of that is up in this area uh, here because the land is pretty flat there as opposed to the steep land um, elsewhere. So would that um, marina work right there? No, it's going to be dry. There would need to be some extension of boardwalk or possibly a path, something we need to come out. Would the boat ramp work? It works now for smaller craft. Would it work with full removal? No, that would need to be re-engineered to probably come along the shore and cut into the deeper area here. Fixable, you know, it's fixable, uh, but it wouldn't work on day one, that's, that, that's for sure. So if you wanted to access your your now 85 foot deep lake, which you probably would, it would require uh, the owners of those facilities to make some adjustments. Um, cost, so again, we have 530 for full removal. 
uh, we have 480 for partial and we have uh, 240 for um, uh, uh, full removal. And I should just point out there, my daughter decided to paint my nails and I forgot I was gonna be doing a uh, Zoom call. So, <laughs> um, Pete, should we take some questions at this point? I, I think we should. Um, so for the first round of questions, I've already gotten a few. If you wanna type them into the chat, we'll probably do that until about 10 of or however long they last. And then we'll open the audio up for a more back and forth process for the last five to 10 minutes. Um, you were just talking about the boat launch, so we'll stay on that. Um, the boat launch will basically be inoperable um, if you do the full removal. Uh, folks asked about that. Um, we don't have a hard and fast answer to um, what the state would do with the boat launch. Um, we don't know. Uh, we, we just don't know um, what their policy would be. Um, uh, somebody asked a really good question, Matt. What would full removal, how would that impact um, homeowners and landowners on Echo Lake and boaters and users down there? The people on Echo Lake would never know. They would, they would never know that anything changed up above. Um, uh, they, they, it does not change. There's not, a, there's not a drain in the bottom of Amherst Lake or anything. We're just taking it down three feet. Once it's down, just like um, when the flashboards came out, unless somebody came up to look, nobody downstream would know. This is no different. Um, uh, the water level, water will still come into Amherst Lake. If you get a big storm, water will come, will come rushing into Amherst Lake, slow down a bit as it, as it spreads out through the lake, and then pass over uh, the net, what's now a natural outlet of the lake uh, into Amherst. If you were to go down to the outlet of, Am of Echo Lake, rather, a lot of people think there's a dam there, but there is no dam. It's a natural channel outlet. And that's essentially what Amherst would be, a natural channel outlet. But the folks on, on Echo would, um, unless they come up and look, they would, they would never know there was a difference. I see Todd with a hand up there. Okay, let me stay in the chat here okay, for just sure. just a little bit longer. A couple more questions and we'll jump to Todd. Um, one person asked about funding. Are there state matching dollars available? There is a lot of funding privately and at, uh, publicly for dam removal. Um, most of us aren't aware of any funding for dam restoration or... Uh, a dam repairs. Um, there was another person who asked a question about, you know, the, the two deep holes. Um, there's a, a 60 foot deep hole and a, roughly an 80 to 90 foot deep hole. You are correct about that. Those are the deepest spots of the lake. The rest of the lake is not that deep, um, but maybe Matt can speak to um, the depths because he's uh, boated and, and done some depth finding. Um, yeah, just in general, uh, it, it will, just as, other than the access, because the access right now is a bit compromised and would be more compromised with removal, other than the access issues, the, the lake, the lake um, uh, feels as it did before when the water was up higher. I mean, the water came down two feet, but there's still, you can still jump off those, that rock cliff into, into uh, 40 plus feet of water. That won't change. Um, so it's really the access issues, uh, but you know, landowners along the shore will again get a little bit more beach. They may need to relocate their their own docks, um, but then the, the 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 lake will be as it was. It'll drop off very. It'll get very deep very quickly in almost all places. Um, you know, the, again, the exception is up where the the Hawk Marina is here, and there's an area down near the outlet over here that's that's relatively shallow. Um, so that will change a bit. But, but by and large, this lake remains as it is today. Once you're in it, it gets deep quick and um, a long linear uh, deep lake. Todd, did you have a comment? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Pete. So Matt was talking about <clears throat> no impacts to the downstream lakes. I was involved in this water drawdown and Ben Green, dam safety chief engineer said, could I monitor the downstream lakes? I live in town. I said, of course. So daily when I went out, I don't remember him, 
how many days it was, doesn't matter. I had places to measure Amherst Lake boat dock, the state ramp, excuse me, <clears throat> at the dam itself, upstream and downstream, Echo, Rescue, and Pauline. And there was no changes to those downstream lakes. When Amherst would rise in storm events, then so would the other lakes. And that's what we expected, as Matt said, there's no drain in any of those lakes, particularly Amherst Lake of question. Thank you. Okay, we had a question about, is dredging the north end of the lake feasible? I don't know if Kelly could talk to that based on her experience post Irene with Lake Rescue. Um, or anyone else who wants to jump in, Todd or? Yeah, now, Kelly, with all due respect, my friend, that's a question for the lakes and ponds section, wetlands. I can't answer that, damn. Safety can't answer that. Nobody here on the line that I know of can answer that. Okay, it was just if, a question from Frank. No, uh, no I yep. understand. And if there is somebody that can answer that from the state government, please do. Yeah, you know, I, I, I can tell you what I think would probably happen having um, got, gotten permits for projects for 20 years here in the state. So normally, if you said, I want to I want to dredge my, my lake here, it, it's, it's a really tough thing to get permission to do. I mean, so tough that it's near impossible. Um, but if it could be shown that some dredging up here as part of the removal project um, would allow this infrastructure to continue to be used, the, the boat ramp in particular, um, I think that's got a fighting chance of getting permitted. Especially, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't es promise it, but if it's part of a dam removal project, that seems to me to be something that, that I, I'd feel comfortable telling a client, let's try it. I think we got a decent chance. Especially if it addresses invasive growth up there because the, the folks that are interested in funding removal to make a more natural state may be interested in that. It's a good point. Can't um, hurt to ask. Can't hurt to ask. I would caution that if we were if that dredging this entire area so that the marina remains viable seems a bit more of a stretch to me. We might, the answer to that might be no. And the answer, the reason for that is this area filled, when, when big floods come in, bringing lots of sediment down the inlet channel here, that sediment deposits here, the finer stuff swirls around and gets deposited in here. And so I think if, if we were gonna propose some dredging, uh, the the opposition to it would be that um, this you're going to have to do this regularly that it's going to it's going to fill back in and it would be hard to get a permit for that whereas more limited area further away from the inlet I think we have a more of a fighting chance so I think I think the, the dredging to support the boat ramp has a fighting chance dredging to support the boat ramp and Hawk Marina uh, I'm not optimistic about that. Okay, we have another question here about uh, catastrophic concrete failure. Uh, Matt, does it happen? Um, yeah, so that's a great, it's a great question. And it's a point of a, a little bit of frustration for me because dam engineering is exceedingly conservative. That just as, um, um, as a rule, uh, we, we, we don't assume catastrophic, we don't assume instantaneous failure, but pretty close to it. Um, we, we assume a very rapid failure. And as, as you I saw in your comment there, you said, wouldn't, would, would it fail instead more gradually as the concrete deteriorates as we're seeing now? Um, that's, what's, that, that's often what happens. You don't get the whole dam disappearing in an instant. Um, and so our analyses that we do for, for removal, um, and you'll see when you read the report, this was, I, this was a, sort of a first cut at it. So we didn't, I didn't go into great detail about how long it would take the dam to fail. Um, I assumed actually that it would fail um, instantaneously. Um, were you to do a more detailed review of how the dam fails, you would let it fail a bit more gradually, but by gradually I mean over the course of an hour rather than instantaneous. We're not talking it fails over a course of a month. It's, it's pretty darn um, quick. And we see what that wave of water moving downstream does to downstream properties. And I went around all of Echo Lake looking at um, topography and locations of camps to try to figure out where houses were located, um, who might get wet. And based on that, there are some houses or camps that are down low within roughly four feet of the water and, and um, 
uh, they'd likely get wet were there a, to be a rapid release of water from Amherst at its current water level. Well, you know, I should mention here also on removal because somebody, some folks have said, why don't we remove the dam and instead put in its place a bunch of rock, kind of build a natural channel that holds the water up where it is or even higher. Um, and and it, it sounds like a good idea because we could say, well, it doesn't look like a dam, but I can tell you the state dam safety folks would absolutely consider that a dam and we would not be able to get a permit for it. It's a non it's a non-starter. In fact, this came up earlier this year on a dam in Barton where I'm not sure how they got as far along as they did, but they proposed to um, do just that, remove a dam, not unlike this, and put in a bunch of rock to build a what, what sort of a natural channel. And um, the state said, no, that's that's a dam. Might not be built out of concrete or steel, but that's a dam. So that that's a non-starter here. Uh, there was a question about uh, annual uh, permit costs and ongoing costs of upkeep. Um, so permit costs, uh, every year a dam owner has to register their dam with the state and pay a fee. That fee is based on um, uh, hazard classification. Um, again, there's high hazard, significant hazard, which is what we are, and then there's low hazard. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what that what those fees are. I know it's a thousand for high hazard, it's 200 for low hazard, and I cannot for the life of me remember what it is for significant hazard. But give me a second, I might find it. So that's the ballpark we're talking about, somewhere between two and maybe Devin, Mike, if you remember, you can make some sign language. Three, thank you. Okay, there was uh, some housekeeping things here. The, the, um, this presentation is being recorded. It will uh, take me a, a while tomorrow. Um, I already have a two hour delay for school because it's supposed to be so cold, to, cold tomorrow. So I'll be getting in late. So sometime probably tomorrow afternoon or uh, Wednesday morning, I'll have the recording ready. I just put a copy of the report, the PDF, it's a 2.5 megabyte PDF into the chat where you can click on it and open it. So that is the report. Uh, so you can download it for yourself and have these wonderful maps that uh, Matt and Todd and Kelly made. Uh, so that's in the chat at the roughly the bottom. Please check that. Uh, I'll put a couple more links in there. Um, all right, going back to the questions here. Um, there's a good question about what's the time frame for final decisions. Um, the, the dam is privately owned um, by the O'Laughlins and they do not want to retain ownership of the dam. Um, so they are um, considering all options with um, not retaining ownership of the dam being uh, the main uh, driving force behind their decision making. And they're interested in uh, all sorts of reasonable solutions. Um, do we know which houses on Echo would be damaged? Uh, is there an image or list of that? Uh, Matt can speak to that. He did a preliminary analysis, a very preliminary analysis of comparing the houses to the water surface level. Uh, he can speak to that real quick. You know, I don't have a list of addresses, or, nor did I make a map of those. Uh, um, uh, given the, the screening for this initial level of study we were doing here, I, I, um, uh, it, was, it was somewhat crude. I can come up with it pretty, pretty easily, though. Um, the state has a nice website with available mapping. It shows all the contours, shows all the houses, and so um, uh, relatively easy to do. I, I'll point out also, though, that it, were somebody to pursue alternatives one or two, full restoration or partial restoration. Um, uh, an engineer like me would, would, would uh, uh, do a much more detailed analysis of where the water goes and who gets hit. The state would require that before they would issue um, a permit. While I'm talking about the state issuing permits, somebody asked, are the standards in Vermont the same as say Louisiana? And there are differences between states, um, uh, but, but there's more similarities than differences. So. Most states have to hold have to meet um, very similar requirements in different states. New Hampshire is another state with very similar requirements. New Hampshire has um, uh, New Hampshire is a lot more stringent, in fact, and no state in the country is getting less stringent in terms of regulations of dams. If you're a dam owner, um, you can expect that 
he will be held to higher, increasingly higher standards. That's what's been happening all around the country, including all of our neighboring states. Uh, there was one good question that someone asked, have we searched our local Amherst Lake owners uh, for possible contributors and interested party for restoration or repair? And um, I don't know if she wanted to speak to it, but we have someone on the line who's been working very, very hard on that. Uh, her name is Alicia, and she kind of coordinates uh, Alicia Armstrong, the Amherst Lake Friends informal online group. She is online, but she may not be actively online right now. I don't know She's if waving anyone... and needs to be unmuted. It looks oh, like. okay. All right, there we go. All right, try it now, Alicia. Okay, finally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as you know, when this whole thing started last April 24th, 2021, wasn't it? Um, we became, we really got up and going um, to try to get the community around the lake uh, motivated to work together and uh, form an, an association. Um, we wanted to start out as an alliance. Um, I regret to say that there, were there was very little participation and it came down to about two, three, four people, maybe ex excluding Mike and Deb, have been really wonderful in talking. But as far as um, forming an, uh, you know, an association, it's been really slow going. Um, I'll send out a lot of emails and I won't get any responses. So I don't know where that stands right now. Pete, do you mind if I make a comment? No, go ahead. It's not just the people on Amherst Lake, the people in the overall community really need to think about this. Do I wanna participate in the future outcome or do I wanna sit back and complain and not have a say in changing the future? People on Echo Lake, people in Plymouth, Ludlow, Mount Holly, Bridgewater, Woodstock, this is a broader community issue and state can't tell everybody what to do, but what is the community outcome, the community decision that we can weigh in on? Well, we can permit this, but we can't permit that. I really, I live in the wrong, opposite side of Plymouth and I'm really hopeful that people will realize that if I have a stake in this, then I need to be involved more and maybe financially if it can be in some. Yeah, can I just say that when, when this started up, I asked, um, I said, why doesn't everybody who's around the lake donate $125 to get us up and going? And nobody wanted to do that. And then um, a little while later, Kathy Rugiano got in touch with me. And so she and I went through our houses and we put together a yard sale. And it was fortuitous because uh, Plymouth was having their yard, their annual yard sale um, Columbus Day weekend. So um, Kathy and I went to the little Plymouth school, well, now the Historical Society, selling our goods. And I think we raised $475, but that's been the only um, fundraising we've been able to do. We've got other things, you know, on, on the line, but I don't, you know, right, raising $530,000 or $580,000, whatever it's going to cost to restore the dam. I just don't know. And, and how long do we have? You know, what's the timeline for that? Let, let, me, let me add here from my conversations with the owners. They, they um, Somebody else is welcome to, to, to rehab the dam as long as they also take ownership of it. So the current owners, um, if, if they remain the owners of it, uh, they will move toward removal of the dam. If it needs to be rehab, they will give the dam away for free. Anyone can have it, but they're not going to retain ownership of a rehab dam, just to be clear. So the I, organization that that um, uh, maybe raises the money would then become the owners of it and, and be responsible for the ongoing annual upkeep of the dam. Right. I've even, I, I don't know if my husband's on or not, but I've even considered giving Deb and Mike a dollar for the dam and, and kind of taking it over. But the amount of support that I've gotten in this alliance and to form association has been nothing. And so, except for Kathleen and um, 
just a couple other people, Kat Kelly has helped, you know, do promotional things, but no, nobody else has really stepped up. So I'm, I'm kind of weary about what the future is. It's just the truth. It's how I feel. Okay. Um, there are a couple people with their hand up. I'm going to get to them. Let them talk now. We'll switch to that. We got about five minutes left. Um, there is one uh, question, Alicia. Have you uh, tried to form a 501c3? The answer is, I think she's researched it, but she has not done it um, yet because we, um, of the in interest. Go ahead. Well, we that's what what we we raised um, four hundred seventy five dollars from the yard sale that Kathleen and I had. Um, we also have a $500 donation. So we have almost $1,000. Um, a 501c3 is in the works or has been. But as I say, you know, we've got a lawyer who's willing to um, do pro bono work, but they are from out of state. So I've been looking for a lawyer in state in order for them to work together. Um, it's been, I believe, a 501c3 cost about $600 to apply. I think the application fees that, that much. I don't know. I could be wrong, but that's what I, that's what my research is. But again, I'm going to say, you know, I'm the only one doing this and I, I, I don't want to do it all by myself. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, unmute Maury. Maury, you have your hand up. You can unmute yourself now. Um, thank you. Um, I noticed that the least expensive is the partial, the 480K is the full restoration. The 580,000 was complete demolition. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. So full restoration is 530, partial restoration 480, removal 240. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, were these numbers put out to bid? How did you come to these figures? Yeah, that's a good question. No, they're not put out to bid. So I, I um, you'll see it in the report, uh, identified what the major work items are, um, say repairing a wall. Based on my measurements, I knew how much concrete that would be. And I applied, um, I knew how many cubic yards of concrete it would be. And I applied a, um, a, a per cubic yard cost to that concrete. Um, so these numbers are fairly subjective then, other um, than the materials. Yeah, yeah. Actually, those materials are probably the most objective ones because I had bid results from Agency of Transportation. Some of the other ones are, are um, um, cruder than that, where I use my, my best judgment and use my experience on doing these sorts of projects around New England. Um, yes, thank, thank yeah. you. Um, last but not least, um, 85 feet, um, sportsman's license sales paid for that launch. And I can understand why you wouldn't want power boats there any longer, although it's always been limited access for that matter. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind that there's a lot of people that do fish that. Um, I don't know where they stand on it. I don't go there often, but I do enjoy it. Thank you very much. Hey, <clears throat> folks, there was a comment, a question about getting the cost estimates from Matt. And if that, if, if there's anybody that looks at them, you need to understand it is typical in the engineering world because you have very limited information that you put on a contingency item. And I was on the consulting side 26 years and people would have a bird on me. Why is there a contingency item? Because we don't know. I'd like to commend Matt and Deb and Mike, Pete, for the work that you've done. This was a very limited budget that could have been 35,000 to 50,000 to get a better answer, a harder answer for you. So if anybody looks at those cost estimates, I've looked at them myself. All the numbers individually and aggregate looked sensible to me. We live in an imperfect world. Now, that's a good point, Todd. This is These are first level ballparks to give you a level of magnitude sense. Is it going to cost 10,000, 100,000, 250,000, or 500,000? And we have some rough estimates on there. Uh, Matt has, uh, I think, smartly 
applied a large contingency, a large um, percentage, um, which nowadays isn't that unusual given the cost of constructions, uh, construction due to uh, the pandemic, uh, employment and supply chain issues. So it's, it's gotten a little bit harder even now to uh, come up with numbers, but I think uh, as a first level estimate, these aren't unreasonable. Uh, Richard, I'm going to get to you next, and then I'll go back, and then I'll go to John. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, for the uh, sake of full disclosure, we're at the opposite end of Alicia's Lake. Um, and while Alicia gets impacted uh, greatly by the reduction in the water, uh, we also have that impact. And I'd like to address that for a second because we tend to talk about the deepest part of the lake, but we don't talk about the average depth of the lake. And when you say you're losing two acres or three acres or four acres, you're talking about water. Uh, but you're not talking about navigable water. And if you want to put a boat or a kayak in that lake, you may have three or four inches of water, but it's not enough for a kayak or a canoe or certainly an outboard motor to run through the lake. So when we talk about acres on the lake, I think it's a bit of a misnomer when we say that the lake is reduced by an acre or two because the use of the lake is not only looking at it, it is people being in it, trying to swim in six inches of water is pretty difficult. Um, so I, I think everybody should be aware of that. I'd also like to address the part of the north shore of the lake, which is on Route 100. That is steep, but it is also the steepest side of the lake. The other three sides are not as steep. And it happens to be the other three sides are where the homes are. So those are the people that you're saying are going to have larger beaches. That's not absolutely true either, because you're going to have the vegetation start to grow and you're going to have reeds and weeds and vines and whatever you have along the shoreline. And, you know, I, I, I see this as a serious impact on the overall lake. It's not just a reduction in the size or acreage of water. And now I'd like to also address a couple of the other points you had. You talk about a thousand year event. I don't know what Irene was, but I would venture a guess that Irene had to be in the 500 year event or more. If such an event was to happen again, and you did not have that dam to slow the water flow. And believe me, I know because we're on the south end of Amherst and we certainly got inundated quite a bit by mud and reeds and, and water and everything else. I don't know what the impact would be on Echo had that dam not been there. And to say that there would be no difference, I am not an engineer, I uh, am not, experienced with flooding, but I cannot see how that dam wouldn't have helped those people on Echo Lake from having less water or less inundation coming through on an event like that. And say that we're not going to have another event like that, I, I don't know if we could. Uh, in today's environment, uh, it seems like we're having 500-year events every 10 years rather than every 500 years. And so I have a concern about that. And finally, the, the dam itself. We talk about the dam, we talk about the walls, you talk about the uh, guiding walls or steering walls or whatever walls they are. Um, is it the walls that are a problem or is it the dam itself, the 78 feet going across, Matt? I, I didn't get a clarification on that because one of my concerns is if you're uh, putting cement on the side walls, that's one thing. But if you have to cement across the whole span of the dam, that's, that's another event. Um, I, I see that the wall on the one side, the steering wall on the one side is in terrible shape. 
but I don't get that same uh, indication on the opposite side. So are we saying both walls have to be replaced? One wall has to be replaced? Both walls and the dam itself have to be replaced? I'm not sure about that. Uh, other than that, I, uh, I have to com compliment Alicia because she has been doing all the, uh, the, the heavy lifting on this. And thank you, Alicia, for doing that. Um, and I also Kathy thank Kathy. <laughs> Kathy. So uh, <laughs> thanks. If you can just answer a couple of those things. And if anybody on this call wants to chip in to help out, I think Alicia, we're more than willing to uh, start getting monies on this. And uh, our T-shirt fundraiser and things like that are things that we're trying to do. But another thing, and I don't know if we have a, a representative from Hawk here. Hawk gets major impacts to all of those homeowners at Hawk uh, because they lose, they actually lose one of the advantages of being a Hawk resident by losing that waterfront. So uh, I think I've said enough. Uh, I'll, I'll thank you and sign off. Um, so I'm gonna start with the, at the last of your questions work back up. So uh, one wall or both walls, it's primarily the wall on your side of the lake, um, on the, the right wall looking downstream. That's the one that's in terrible shape. That's the one that's rotating. The other wall has a bit of rotation, but it's not significant. And so I did not include replacing that one. I, um, I included some costs for fixing some cracks in the concrete and that sort of stuff, but it's mostly the one over on your side. Um, uh, you asked if it's the walls um, or, the, or the slab also, the, the spillway across. The spillway is in pretty decent condition other than being undermined. So I've included costs for fixing that undermining of it, but I've assumed that the spillway itself, that, that horizontal, the flat part is, is, is in reasonably good, good shape and we can, we can work with it. Um, uh, you talked about uh, the Amherst Lake slowing the flow of water before it reached Echo. And that's true, and there would be a little difference. The, the, the bigger the water surface you have, um, the more attenuation, the more lessening of the, of the flood flow that you get downstream. So if you have a very small lake, it's not gonna lessen the flow much. It's gonna fill up and the water is gonna go right out. And so um, uh, you are correct that with a smaller lake, there's less of that um, reduction in the flow. Um, uh, but I would say in, in a more intensive study would demonstrate it, not much. It would, be an, it would be an indiscernible change to the people in Echo Lake. You're right, it's happening, but it's a, at this point, it's an academic issue. Um, it's not making much difference. Um, oh. And you talked also about it being not steep everywhere. And you are, I think you are correct. The Route 100 side is the steepest, but from all the um, uh, uh, topographic data we collected with, all the, with, this, with the sonars, it's pretty darn steep on the opposite bank too. There are a couple places where there are some channels coming in uh, that bring sediment and it makes it a little bit flatter. Um, but, it, but even over on that other side, it drops off really quickly. So the issue in terms of access are really in three places. They're at the uh, Southern end near you because it's relatively flat in that little pocket there, as you know, um, before it then drops off again. Uh, and then up near the boat launch in the marina, that's the second place where it's quite flat. And you're right, like the water, we may have, the shoreline might have only retreated two feet, but you can't use the water because it's only a foot deep. You're right about that. So that's the area. And then the inlet channel, those people used to essentially have docks that went out right out to the lake and now it's a free flowing stream and they don't have an option to extend. Finally, I think to me, I look at it and think uh, it sure looks to me like there's a very nice, functional, useful lake here, even with the dam removed, but we have real access issues that need to be addressed. Seems to me access is the big issue. Access where your house is located near the dam there at the southern end. Certainly access at the boat ramp, either extending the boat ramp or, um, or, or possibly dredging. If I were Hawk, I'd, I'd look at putting in an elevated wooden boardwalk that goes out to the new edge of water, problem solved. I, I think there are different ways to do this. The folks on that inlet channel, they're in a tough spot. They don't have the option of, of extending a dock or something like that. So uh, it, it, it's, it seems to me that um, for me, at least this boils down to access. We still have a, 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 a quite a good functional lake. Okay, I got uh, three people or two people stacked up and Kelly might have a quick uh, comment to make. She's uh, the Black River Action Team person. I'm gonna unmute her. Are you there, Kelly? Maybe not. Oh, 
There she goes. All right, it looks like you're unmuted, Kelly. She she has a laptop that is perpetually against her. <laughs> so maybe, um, maybe she can text me and I can. Say. Yeah, you can put it in the chat too, uh, Kelly. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump to uh, John and then I'm gonna go to Karen. So here we go, John. I'm telling you, you can there. There we go. Okay. Um, my only question is time frame. Um, it's kind of been dodged around a little bit. If ownership is transferred to a nonprofit or any other um, organization that's going to handle the dam, how much time does that organization have to raise funds for any mitigation factors? And that's all I got. Uh, who wants to tackle that? I could. I can kinda... tackle that. The, okay. The, the uh, um, uh, I can try to at least the the water control plan that the dam safety folks put together a year ago that led to this temporary lowering of the water, or, or I shouldn't say temporary, led to removing those poles that held the the, the, the flashboards in place. Um, part of that uh, uh, included a time frame of two years um, to uh, restore the. Um, to, to get permits to, to put something, a dam back in that would restore the water level. Um, typically, I can tell you though, when you take, when you lower the water level on a dam, you have five years by federal permits to, to get that water back up. And, it, and if you don't, um, uh, it becomes much, much more challenging. So I think the answer is between two and five. Um, it's, it's pretty quick, it's pretty quick. Um, and I can also say in terms of timing for my conversations with the owners that, um, and understand these owners have, uh, there, there, there's, there's liability issues. There's, per, there's um, insurance issues. I mean, it can be um, hard to get uh, homeowners insurance when you own a dam. That, that can sometimes you just simply can't do it. Um, so uh, they, they are not. My understanding is they are inclined to um, uh, push, push forward with removal. If, if an organization, if a group wanted to um, um, instead take it over, great. Um, but, uh, but uh, they're not. Um, and my understanding is not inclined to, to, to uh, wait in hopes that that happens because they need to address the issue in front of them. Okay. Uh, Kelly did put something in the chat basically to the extent of everyone should get a hold of Alicia um, and to a kind of restart the um, process of, of dealing with, you know, the next steps. Um, and if, if folks want, we've got a couple more questions. Um, uh, we can go for another five to 10 minutes. I can pass off the host of this meeting to someone else and you're welcome to use our um, uh, Zoom time to continue to meet for a little longer if uh, someone wants to take over that hosting. But I'm gonna let Karen can ask a question. This, can I just say one thing? Um, yes, wrote, Alicia, I, go ahead. For the 501c3, I've already written the bylaws, they're all written. So we've got that going. We're just wait, we're, we were kind of waiting for a meeting like this to make a decision about moving forward to establish the 501c3. We've got- Okay, yeah. wonderful, that's great news. Karen is unmuted, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think I have my answer already. I'm Karen Matursky over on um, Echo Lake. And what I'm understanding then is the next process, the process now goes through decision-making. And it sounds like the owners of the dams have made their decision and they can go forward with what their decision is. Is that true? Uh, the, the owners do not want to retain ownership of the dam. And um, uh, if they do retain ownership for um, an extended period over the next uh, couple of years and nobody um, uh, decides to make a move, uh, they will pursue removal with grant funds. Okay, so this could take then a couple of years for this to happen. Yeah, the, I mean, removal can't be done overnight because grants have to be secured, which are available for removal. Um, so the decision can be made and then grants and all of those things happen. So it could take two years if the dam was going to be removed. Um, okay, that's one of my question. The other one is you said there wouldn't be any impact either way um, for Echo Lake residents. 
Right. The, uh, right. Matt, can sp Matt, Matt has spoken to that. I don't know if he wants to say so something there else. there would be but... a slightly reduced risk of damage um, and risk to people should the uh, dam fail. So with the dam gone, there's not a risk of dam failure. So that's, um, that, you know, that, that's sort of academic also um, in yep. some regards. Uh, and then in terms of uh, flood flows to, to Echo Lake, again, academically, there's a little bit of a difference um, during major, major flood events, but uh, um, not something that anybody on Echo Lake could discern. And I'll point out also the outlet of Echo Lake is smaller than the outlet of Amherst. And so during really big storms, Echo backs up onto Amherst. Even the annual flood on goes uh, backs up from Echo Lake and starts touching the spillway on Amherst. Um, so yeah, not much. If, you're, if, if you lived on Echo Lake, you would never be able to discern a difference. I'm confident saying that. Okay. I, I mean, I'm just worried about safety. That, that was my concern. And I got that answer. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and I guess we just then wait. Is that what we do? Well, I My think... friends, no, don't wait. <laughs> if I were the O'Laughlin's, I would pursue taking it out. So you need to meet their time schedule. Please, you all no. need to get together. I agree with... Just asking Kelly, the, this is a golden opportunity. Right. I, I'm just asking a question. Like, what's our next process? What do we do with the owners to help them through this? Or I, I don't know where it goes from here. We need, and, to take, we need to take away, we need to buy it from them if we want, if we want more control, I, I would say, right? Devin, Mike, want me, are you here in Vermont? Uh, are you here on, on the lake? <laughs> They are on the line. Oh, do you want me to un give me a thumbs up if you want to be unmuted? Okay. There you go. You should be able to do it now. They are unmuted. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will give you the day. If you want the dam, I will give it to you and a dollar. Uh, we have asked everybody that we can think of, state, municipal, regional people uh, to do this. How this dam got into private ownership, uh, the more we are finding out about this, um, it's, I know it's hard to believe, but so anybody who wants it, I will please happily give it to you. So. <laughs> when are you coming up again? Uh, are, are if you, you want the dam, I will come up tonight. So, <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer who didn't warn you about this and get five hundred thousand dollars, and I'm asking only half jokingly. You know, the, the dam was there, but the uh, the how should I say this nicely? The, the understanding of the repercussions of it weren't were not there i mean you knew the dam was there you could see it there was no question it was there and honestly it looked kind of nice and peaceful with water going over it um the repercussions of when we started digging into what this entailed and what it actually needed um it, it's it's staggering um so the o'laughlin's are the fifth people buying a dam that has been deemed needing to be removed or repaired, they're the fifth that I've seen. And this is not a good situation. It's not really fair to them, but this is life. We live in an imperfect world. Well, I think I think the realtor community should be aware of what they're doing. <laughs> All right, we got a couple questions here. I've got a couple repeat questions. Oh, it looks like I have a new question from a person who hasn't ad asked one, it's the, uh, Melville or whatever, I'm going to unmute them. Oh, not, it didn't quite work. Try again. There you go. Hi. I'm just, everybody's asking a lot of questions about, you know, what's the next step. If you've been through any kind of development or fundraising campaigns, we already, the process is, is together for the 501 3C, which is amazing. There's an interested group of people here. We need to raise enough funds to indicate that we have a base of support. And then we leverage that to go out into the community to say, we've raised this much, people are committed, we're gonna, we're gonna fix this dam, here's what the plan is, here's how much it's gonna cost, and then we try to raise the rest of the money. So it's a commitment among the initial group to say, we're gonna go for this, and we're gonna try and make this happen. But unless you've got that base of support more than $475 you know, dollars and a $500 um, anonymous donation, 
you need more than that to go against whatever the agreed upon plan is. And so we need to agree what the plan is through the 5013C, develop that base, and then like get out the vote. And it's a ground effort. It's calling people, it's knocking on doors, it's all of that. But if we wanna save the lake, that's what it's gonna take. And Alicia and team has done an amazing job. I mean, you've got all of us together. Everybody was waiting for the report. That's a major accomplishment. So now where do we go from here? We already have the owners saying we wanna sell. Um, let's create a handoff situation. There's a, been a lot of, there's been a lot, there are minutes written. And if you, if anybody wants the minutes um, that we, of all the meetings we had prior to this, uh, you can have them. If you just email me at um, amherstlakefriends at gmail.com. I also put in the chat, uh, I can put it in again. Uh, the, yeah, I'll do that again uh, at the bottom here. It's in there a couple times. I also put a depth map in there, but it's high up in the chat. Um, here's the Facebook group and there's a, um, in there. Okay, I'm gonna do three more questions and then I'm gonna sign off. We got a repeat question, we'll go in this order, uh, Maury, Richard, and John, and then uh, I can pass it off to someone else if you wanna continue. I do have this pretty locked down. It's kind of hard, hard to unmute people, so that may not be that useful if I pass it off to someone else. Sorry, go ahead, Maury. Um, yes, thank you. Um, regarding the 500 year flood, um, I recall the flood of 27, pretty much inundated Springfield prior, of course, to the North Springfield Dam being built and uh, Muckross. 69 was pretty bad in Ludlow, as was 73. If anybody has been to the steakhouse in the south end of town, the water was up to the second floor window. <clears throat> and then we have Irene. Um, Act 250, I understand, started in like 1970. I didn't know when Hawk got going, but you know, they got some skin in the game or they ought to because they built that valley up quite a bit. Um, maybe Todd could help me. What is the status on the copper mines or is that a different section of the state? Todd may have jumped off. Uh, yeah, no, I see him there. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, I got back in with copper mines. Upstream. You mean gold mines? No, where were the copper mines that they were spoken of um, during Irene that caused havoc in our water resources? There, there's some up in like Thetford and Stratford and Vershire. Yeah, way up there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. different watershed. Total, different watershed, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to uh, Richard. Oh. There you At, go, Richard. You're back. I, yeah, gotcha. I just wanted to uh, readdress the question, Matt, about Echo. Uh, because Money Creek, when we had Irene and you looked at an, over, an aerial view of Amherst Lake, it was brown. Echo was not. And, you know, that spillway held back all that mud, all that debris. And I can't see how we could have minimal uh, impact on Echo Lake if that dam was not there. I, I just don't understand how that would be the case because the water would just be flowing and that, that tidal wave that came through would not have been held up by the dam. So all that water, all that mud. And, and the other part is because I could see it, the spillway on the other side of the dam going into Echo, had all sorts of debris and everything else in there. And after Irene, that was cleared right out. Uh, but all the other stuff, all the wood and the logs and the debris was all backed all the way up into, uh, well, from the dam all the way along my property. And uh, so I know personally, we pull that out. And I know if it was that on that side of the dam, it didn't go all the way through to the other side of the dam. So I, 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 I don't know how 
there could be minimal impact on Echo or any of the following lakes if that dam wasn't there because the water would have to flow. Yeah, but what you're, what you're missing here is that the, the portion of the lake that we lose when the water level goes down is we lose 16 acres, 16 additional acres roughly. And that's almost, almost entirely up around the uh, boat launch um, and the marina. That's where almost all of that acreage is. So you imagine this big slug of water coming through in Irene. Um, and uh, uh, it wasn't that area around the marina that really helped dissipate the flow. No, uh, we, we haven't lost much area to dissipate the flow. It's still there. When we can run the numbers on it hydraulically and it's still No, 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 Matt. I'm not saying the, the acreage or the size of Amherst dis uh, dissipated the flow. I'm saying the dam itself, the structure itself stopped no the flow. It's just there's no mechanism for that. Yeah, I think there was some sediment that did make it down to rescue because I know they were. Yeah, but not if you look, go back and look at the aerial views of all the lakes and you can see Amherst is dark brown, Echo maybe tan. You get to, uh, to rescue and it's a lighter color. They were all impacted by the silt coming down, but nowhere as bad as, as Amherst. That's probably yeah, our, is our, up the top of it, say, so. yeah, it, reasonable and lastly, observation. And lastly, we do not need to have a 501c3 to purchase the dam, do we? The 501c3 only makes it tax deductible. It doesn't make it an entity. So what we need to do is band together to create the entity to buy the dam, and then we can institute the 5013C3 uh, for the donation so they will be tax deductible. The other that's, thing- That's need, a legal question, Richard, and I don't know if there's any attorneys on the- uh, I, I don't know, Todd, I'm, 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 I'm pontificating to some degree here because I'm <laughs> somewhat of a sales pitch. And when you got an audience and uh, Alicia can tell you, we've been dying to get support. If we can get people to support this and to, pony up i mean this is the time to do it richard okay um i've i've i'm just a couple housekeeping things here i'm is it okay alicia if i i've figured out my mute setting so now as i just saw the m nelvilles unmuted themselves so everyone can unmute themselves now and i'm gonna make alicia the host and then I can actually sign off anyone else who can sign off if they want. And you guys can use a little bit of time for some planning. I think that would be really re uh, useful since you're already all here. So let me do that. Hang on just a second. Make sure it works. I Alicia, do. did you get my note about getting your all right. contact? All right, hang on, Richard. Did you get that little host uh, message in the chat, Alicia? Did I get the host in the message? It said it It did. It. I'm getting private messages too, so I just want to... Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, you should be good. You could try. Try muting me. <laughs> we're, okay, let me see where you are. I'm, I'm the one I've never the done this before. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if someone's... You're going to learn quickly. Well, we can talk. Um, yeah, okay. I think that, okay, so we've got... we've. We've got a lawyer who is willing to do pro bono to set up the 501c3. It's, it's the Hawk owner. Um, I have to find a lawyer local, um, which I was going to do after this meeting. I have a couple um, of names to contact. Um, I guess somebody needs to be in the bar of, in Vermont. To, to, so I, don't, I don't know exactly. I haven't heard back what exactly they need, the, the pro bono needs, pro bono light lawyer needs, excuse me, tongue tied tonight. Um, the five, the, um, the bylaws are written. They just need to be tweaked a little bit. Um, I had some questions. Um, and I guess what we need to do is meet and I would love to do it in person. I don't know how people feel about that, but we can use the community center. It's free in Plymouth. Um, we can just arrange to meet there. And I don't know how many people are local. Um, I was, I've been doing uh, maps and kind of tracking people where people are getting local addresses, out of state addresses. 
um, asking for a core group. I actually ran into Laura Bennett in the grocery store. I said, okay, you're going to be, <laughs> you're going to be part of this association. <laughs> I don't know if Laura's still on or not. Hey, hey Alicia. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Hey, how are you? Good. Hey, how are you? Good. Good. Great job. Hey, Peter. Great job, Matt. Great job, guys. Um, hey, I just have a question. Um, I asked it in the chat. I don't think I got a clear answer. So I, I get it. Um, the state is willing to give money to remove the dam. Um, I want to know if anybody from the state, I think there's a senator on, is plans, will there be plans to fix the boat launch, improve access, probably clean the lake as well? And will that all be factored into the total cost of removing the dam? Right. What is that total cost? And will that be looked at and analyzed when they make the decision? Because I'm still trying to figure that out, because if you take the dam out and then you got to go and the state's not going to fix the access, what's the cost of fixing that? And does it end up being more money than if they were to just fix the dam altogether? That coupled with the question that I had for Matt, which is that this dam is not going to catastrophically fail. It's going to slowly fail. You know, I, I'm just, uh, I'm curious, what are the decision-making factors? Are we just talking about the dam? Or are we going to look at the whole picture from a state level, from a representative level, taxpayer level, usage level, et cetera? What's going into the decision-making process? Well, I can, you want to go ahead? Who? You know, I'm not sure. Well, we did talk about, the, okay, so what, um, Matt said was that the dam would cost two, about $240,000 to remove. Right. And then they can't imagine mm -hmm. that the state's going to let the boat, I mean, we're, the, the boat landing would have to be repositioned somewhere. Okay, so how much is and that so, going to cost? How much is that going to do? You got, people's they, property, you got property along that side that are going to be impacted. So does that need to be analyzed and figured out before the state says, oh, here's, two, you know, whatever to take the dam out. And then down the road, we got to go fix that for a half a million dollars. So how is this going to be decided? How are we going to put all these pieces together? Matt, if it's you, Pete, if it's you, Todd, or we're state senator on the phone, maybe it's you, uh, you know, but are we looking at all those pieces? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I did not, just so you know, my, my cost, and when you see it in the report, you'll see it does not include, for removal, does not include any kind of um, improvements to the access. That would be something separate. Because of where the, the grant funding is, is really in the name of ecological restoration. So even if rebuilding the access with part of an overall removal project that would be funded separately. I'm going to jump not, in. I don't here. know what that would cost. I've not estimated those costs. I'm going to jump in here and say, so the, the, the grant that would remove the dam is a clean water grant with state funding through DEC. The access is owned and operated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, which is a different it's the same agency, different department, um, and, and their decisions on using that, extending that, that's a fish and wildlife department decision. Um, and so I don't think anyone on this call can answer that. I think it is a good idea if we move forward um, with design plans either way or with, with further engineering studies to include looking at the, the access because that's a public resource. It's a well-used public resource and we certainly wouldn't want to lose that. Um, but, so we could include it in, in st further studies, um, but it's not the decision of, of DEC or the grant makers or any of us um, to make that decision. That's Department of Fish and Wildlife. So Larry, is, is there yeah, an, an environmental sense. impact study on what would happen with the uh, dam being removed? Because to Tom's point, I think, you know, at some point in the state itself, someone's going to have to do the cost analysis of whether it was worth the $240,000 to remove the dam if it's going to cost the state of Vermont $500, $600, a million dollars to do all the other work. I'll just tell you in practice, that is not going to, I've never seen it happen. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I've never seen that, that process take place for a project like this. Right. But Matt, is that because you're saying there's different departments and nobody brings them all together to do that cost analysis? Or is it just because 
one department has a budget and they move the way they want and another department has their own budget. We Why have had a lot of internal discussions with various programs. All of these are very complicated, convoluted and unique. So we can try to get that conversation to happen. I don't know what the likelihood of that will be. Probably could happen. You know what we could do, Todd? Um, Todd, if you can give me the name of somebody, fish and, it would be Fish and Wildlife. Is that the? Or is it lakes or is it rivers or is it dams or is oh, it? I can, I can uh, find out. As this goes forward, any, any plans that are drawn up, any decision that's made um, on, on removal or reconstruction will go through all sorts of state permitting processes. So all those agencies, all those departments and all the sub-programs within the departments will be looking at any plans um, and have to review those and have to provide permits for lake from lakes and ponds, from the rivers programs, from the dams program, all of those are going to be looking at anything that moves forward. So in the fisheries folks will do that as well at Fish and Wildlife, um, as well as the access folks, all, all, everybody gets involved when the agency coordinates pretty well on, on commenting and making sure that any plans like this would go forward. Um, and I know there's been a lot of discussion within the lakes and ponds program because it's such a, uh, the whole lake is a resource. Um, fisheries has, has chimed in already. So that there is already a lot of coordination going on and there will be a lot more going forward with whichever decision is selected to move forward. Um, all those folks will be involved. So hope whatever comes out of this will be thoroughly reviewed. I can at least guarantee that. Local, state, and federal permitting. I think it'd be, at some point, we need to find out who sits on top of all of them. And maybe that's the person we need to talk to. All of you in the community sit on top of this pyramid. <laughs> Why don't I feel that way? <laughs> we live in an imperfect world. We've just started this conversation, well, continuing the conversation. Right. right. Well, I think the next step is to get the 501c3 set up and have a meeting mm. and decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and all the people that we need to talk to and pursue the different options at the same time. Well, regardless, yeah, yeah. I mean, regardless, I mean, if, okay, so let's say if we if we restore the dam, we're gonna to have to do fundraising or, or rebuild the dam or, or make a new one. Um, if the dam, if the dam's taken out, we've got a lot of shoreline that we're gonna to have to really be um, conscious of because we don't want invasive species growing in and because Kelly and I right. um, already mm -hmm. identified um, the Phragmites and have had a couple of um, digging parties, so to speak. Um, and we've got a plan to um, put some heavy black paper or plastic down on what we cut down last year. And there's another stand down on Carl Roller's um, land and we need to talk to him and I'm surprised I don't think Carl, Carl are you on here tonight okay I thought he was going to be here so there's a lot of stuff to consider in in addition to the dam for the the health of the lake is it possible to establish a budget to create this startup organization so that a core group of people can contribute to that, they know what they're contributing to, and that there's money to actually move this forward. Because to me, that sounds like the interim step. And then once we clarify some of the details on this, I mean, at least now we have a budget for three possible options, right? And that I think is clarity that people were waiting for to, to figure out like, is this actually viable? Can we? 
Can we afford this? Could we put a price tag on it? Can it be saved? What are the options? So now we have that. We've got the basis of your organization. You guys have made tremendous progress. Can we establish a budget, make it public within this group, ask for donations so that we have the money to take action towards the next step, which is deciding on what the plan is and then raising the additional money. We've got, we've got the plan. It's all written in the minutes that uh, the meetings that we've had before. We were, um, I think a lot of people were just waiting for this meeting to happen. Okay, great. I agree. I agree, Alicia. I think everybody has been waiting for this. This was, yeah. this was the uh, shoe to fall. So now we know what courses of action we have to do because before this, everybody was sitting around waiting for an answer. Yeah. yeah. Well, or the idea, I mean, we're still going to move forward, you know, before this meeting happened and now after, it seems like we've got a good plan in place, which is to get the 501c3 set up and just to start fundraising from there and seeing what we can do. I've talked to other um, pe people around the state who have been in the same situation. And what's really interesting is that one, one association was a lot was allowed to, well, well, Lloyd's of London, I believe, insured each officer. So basically the association owned the dam. Um, right. all, all my notes are in my office. They're not here with me tonight. Um, and then there was another similar um, group who formed an association and they couldn't get insurance. So they weren't able to, you know, so these are all things I, I, the biggest concern here, Alicia, so everybody knows, and I think the O'Loughlin's will tell you, is the insurance coverage for the dam, the liability exposure for any damages downstream and around the lake. So if you buy a dam, and I don't mean to speak for you, but if you buy a dam, you certainly incur a tremendous amount of exposure for uh, civil liability. And uh, one of the other things is if you're a, uh, an officer in that organization that owns a dam, you are personally responsible as well. So <clears throat> to set up a 501c3 is wonderful because it's tax deductible. And again, Todd, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I spend a lot of time with lawyers. Um, if you have an organization, you have it as a 501c3, it only means that it's tax deductible. If you have an organization, those people that run the organization have personal exposure to the liability of someone being hurt or to property being damaged. That may be the bigger cost than the, uh, the actual repair to the dam. That's what we've discovered is like, if, if the association was to um, purchase the dam, uh, then the, the, I guess the issue is, uh, can we find an insurance company that's going to insure all the officers in the association who own the dam? So there's just and, and the dam itself or, uh, or the organization for that liability exposure. Mm -hmm. So and that's where we get our pro bono lawyer on. Yep. Which is good. Although um, they've had some setbacks in their family. So I haven't... <sighs> my conversation, my contacts with them have been very spotty, but I did recently hear because I said, I think we're going to move forward with this. What, what do we need in terms of a Vermont lawyer? What kind of a Vermont lawyer do you need? John and I actually did look up some, a lawyer in Vermont who I guess specializes in dams and the, uh, the, the price tag on that was $5,000 to get him to help us. So we said, well, maybe we'll, Try something else. Well, we almost have five hundred. We've got we got almost. I think we got about a thousand dollars because we had sixty five dollars in donations at the tag sale. Okay. Up and over the shoes and sheets and. <laughs> <laughs> We sold tax, <laughs> tax, tax sale. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It really we promote we we were able to talk it up, so that's mm -hmm. good and create some awareness. We'll do we'll do more. 
just for the sake of that. We also um, talked to some people about getting some um, events on the lake, like uh, uh, like a uh, one of the uh, snowboard ski shops up in Killington. First Stop Ski Shop had reached out to me, and we spoke um, about getting some events on the lake to raise some money. Um, and John Toloski, are you still on? No, he talked to think some kind of a oh, this strange boat that they wanted to store in the backyard at the you know up here at the cottage and. <laughs> So Alicia, if we went out and basically we need one of those uh, thermometers yeah. showing how much money, but I think we need the, to show not only how much money we've collected, but how much money we need to get a 501c3, how much we need to get for a lawyer, how much we need to get to repair the dam, and it's, uh, you know, how much uh, Matt thinks this thing is going to cost, because I, I think Matt... Uh, I think you're very conservative in your numbers. Mm. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. I was just about to post a, a comment here to the whole group. Those numbers, I think, are decent numbers for doing the work uh, this coming year. Should we, you know, were we ready to do it? Um, uh, I did made no effort to project out, say, five years on what, um, uh, for instance, what, what impact, for instance, inflation might have on on the cost of construction and that sort of thing. So just Keep that in mind. Those are numbers for doing this work now. And um, I tried to be conservative. I'm not positive I was. You go look at some dam projects around this state and people are spending $700,000 on a dam that uh, is of, of similar size. Um, so I, I don't think they're, I tried to be a little bit conservative. I, I didn't want to lead people astray, but I tried not to be excessively so. So Matt, I've got a question. If the dam was removed by the state, and then we started again. Would the estimates for rebuilding the dam be the same or would they be lower? So if we remove the dam and started from scratch, would the cost be the same or lower? They'd be much, much higher. And right. you and you would not get a permit to do it. Or would they be higher? You'd never get a higher. permit to do it. Never, oh, ever, okay. ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can't say that. Trust Maria, enough. she knows. Yeah, Maria <laughs> knows. You will never get a permit to rebuild the dam once it's gone. And uh, Deb and I went around southern Vermont with Marie. I don't remember when that was. It must have been July or August. I think Jay was there, too. And we looked at different dams that were removed. And we, were look we actually looked at a dam that was saved, too. And I think that was $800,000. Is that in Guilford? That's yes, in Guilford, sweet that's Sweet Pond yeah. Dam. I mean, you know, keep in mind, most dam removals, if you go Googling dam removals, you're gonna see free flowing rivers. And this is unique because there's still a, a big deep reservoir when this dam comes out. So we say removal, we're not losing a lake. Changing for sure, but we're not losing a lake. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, Richard, you know, you're down at the south end. I, I've been looking at your shoreline and I guess you're not going to be, I'm the one that's going to be impacted the most. No, no, there's more and more shoreline every day. I mean, that dock, <laughs> that dock uh, I got uh, at least two more lengths of my dock in there to get to a dock that was right along the shore. So it's gone out, I'd say at least uh, 30 feet from where it was by removing those two uh, planks. So we talk about, you know, how much, Depth we've reduced, but that translates like the the old soup bowl. As you uh, as you lower the, the the amount of water, the sides go in significantly. Yeah. So there is a lot, not as much as your end, <clears throat> but you know we're going to see that, and uh, you're going to see all that growth come in, and all along the uh, coastline on the 100 side is all going to fill in with vegetation. It's going to be a mess. It, it will be. Was, was anyone... Can I um, ask you why you think it would be a mess? I'm not sure what you're thinking is going to happen to it. I uh, would invasive try. species of growth along the sides of the lake that it's going to be... A, it's going to look like a swamp along the sides of the lake. Well, right. I think what Matt, you're going to see... We, we, I'm seeing it already at my end because I'm the shallow end of the lake and I'm already seeing it. And it's a lot of like reeds and grasses and like right. cattails. And... and it, yeah, and we're preventing the Phragmites from taking hold. We right, really but can't. the other part of it, Alicia, is you can't, like, I'm out there weeding them, pulling them up, but you can only go so far because then you start getting into the mud 
and you can't weed up there. And that's where that's all going to grow up through. And right. you're going to have all these reeds coming along the all the banks around it. Kelly has, um, Kelly isn't here anymore, but we'll definitely involve her because she, I didn't want to hear it, you know, this past summer about the possibility of what kind of plants we're going to have to plant. I did not want to hear it, but I'm ready to hear it. So she's got some good ideas about what, about things to put in that are, are you know, uh, that are, um, what do I want to say, indigenous to the area um, that will be look nice. I've already seen like the Delta out there, the Delta um, where the, the river comes into Lake Amherst. Um, the Delta was all, I be believe it or not, it was all like sandy beach this summer. It was wonderful. I got out there and played around. The geese were there. And now it's all starting to grow in with uh, cattails. Yeah, and that's going to continue. Yeah, that will continue for sure. But it's very, you know, my, my dock where my floating dock is, I'm the only person who has a floating dock on the, on the lake. It's 15 feet there. It drops right off. It's like you go out and it's like you see the, you see the, you know, you go out past the, the old dead tree that's, that's stuck in the, in the mud up here. And then you go out a little bit more and then boom, it goes down. Yeah. So how far is that now from where it used to be? Um, I'm going to, as soon as it's safe to go out on the ice, I am going to take a tape measure and, and measure all that because I left the dock in the water this year, I'm getting too old, to bring it in. <laughs> I just want to interject the last day of trout season between Echo and Amherst. It was a raging torrent. I mean, there was stuff getting washed into Echo that was just astonishing. We ended up going to Colby. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it, there's nothing to stop all that. Anyway, well, um, it does, okay, so amherstlakefriends at gmail.com is our, our, our email. We also have a Facebook page under the same name um, where we post pictures. Anybody's allowed to, um, encouraged to um, join us there. Uh, if there's other kinds of social media that you want me to um, start up, I will. Um, and oh, we, is the donation option on the Facebook page? Not, not yet, just because we wanted to wait to be, for it to be tax deductible. But, if, but we, I, when we first started this in April, I said, let's all of us who are concerned about this each donate $125. So to where do we donate today? Well, um, you, can, you can send me the check if you trust me with it, and I'm going to keep it. I'm not, I didn't even start. Or something. Well, we, we went through, if I was to send you the meeting minutes, we went through some really tough hopes and dreams and then being just like let down where we found, we thought we found somebody who was going to be act to hold our funds for us and, you know, be sort of a sponsor and that just fell through. So we said, well, well, you know, we'll we'll put the we'll put the money in a shoebox until we get this five hundred one three C three set up, and then we. Can Lisa, I trust you. I'll send you the money. Where do we send the money? Tell everybody. So forty seven Scout Camp Road, Alicia Armstrong, forty seven Scout Camp Road, zero five zero five six. Alicia, also, I do have uh, thirsty. Um, the names of the Echo Lake were. We started in the summertime getting a group together, as you know, um, and I will make sure that all the um, participants that were here tonight that I have emails of, um, I will forward all this information to them also. Because I think, Karen, you wanted to start an association down there, and we thought, well, why don't we combine them? Because Rescue and Pauline are combined. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, we could combine our forces that would be wonderful. And um, is your, your house just being all worked on and getting a second floor? It is. It's beautiful. So when are you going to be up again? Uh, I don't know when I can live there. <laughs> I oh. <don't> know. <laughs> okay. So well, I'm, I'm uh, on, you know, I, I'm, I can, I, you guys can get in touch with me, either email or call me. My phone number is, I'll give it to you. Uh, myself for dedicated to the lake is zero eight zero two five five eight zero zero four zero. My address is forty seven Scout Camp Road, 
Plymouth, Vermont, 05056. And I'll put that out. I'm not so sure I'm going to put my phone number out on the Facebook page, but um, when I get to my, when I'm, I'm off tomorrow, but when I get into work on Wednesday, I'll get on my computer where all the addresses are and I'll send it out from there. Alicia, we're ready to uh, do a grassroots efforts at the uh, Hawk Resort, the Hawk Mountain, and Good. start those funds going. Where do you, um, where do you live up there? On, live up on the hill, right? Yep. Behind me. <laughs> we live all the way up on Merlin Way, which is on the south side of the mountain. But okay. people need to know, what am I giving money for and what is it going to accomplish? Exactly. Yeah, we need to be very specific. Richard. <laughs> so if we, are, if we are raising money to fin it, to you know, get a plan together based on the three options in front of us, we need to be very explicit about that because people want to know what their money's going to, who's managing it and what the accountability is. So if it's, you know, give a hundred, give 500, and this is what we're looking to accomplish, we need to do that. And then, as I said earlier, it's all about creating a groundswell of support, showing that there's money and dollars behind this, that it's viable. And then you try to find the most influential people to give money that have a network, and then you get them to go get other money. And then we build, we build from there. But right now, it sounds like we need money just to get going. You know, are we, do we really have a pro bono lawyer? Are we going to need another one? How are we going to finish, you know, the governance structure for the, and, and are we going to be a 501, 3C or something else? I mean, all of that takes some, some dollars. So, you know, we're committed to like getting this up and running. We feel like saving this lake and we're in, uh, in all honesty, getting the dam, the full, the full dam back is what we would like because it, it's destroying the shoreline and it's destroying the access and the enjoyability of the lake. Full restoration. Will you send me, um, will you text me your contact oh, information? Yeah. Yeah, I'm on Facebook, but I'll, I'll send it to oh, you. I'm not, I'm not an active Facebook user, but I joined your Facebook page because <laughs> I believe in this, but okay. I hate Facebook. But I also oh. just published your address and phone number in this chat. So if anybody wants to like get behind this now, do it, please. Yeah, make a donation. I'll start keeping track. And um, I need, a, you know, I need, I need some buddies to help me here. Um, even you if you We've got a core group. We'll we'll get together. This wonderful. Um, we'll just start from there. We'll have to meet and we'll have to talk. Yep. But I've already found out that as again, I, if anybody missed this, um, Plymouth has the historical society that that used to be the school, and we can use that for free. Right. To meet. Go ahead. And it's got Wi-Fi and everything. <laughs> so modern. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to sign off. Me Thanks, too. Guys. Everybody Let's be in touch. Thank you, everybody. Good Bye. job. Richard, Alicia. when are you guys coming up again? Oh, gosh. <laughs> it seems like it's been so difficult the last couple of weeks to get up there. Um, we're going to try getting up either next weekend or the weekend after for sure. What about uh, you? But we have a ton of work to do there. Yeah, we all, it's never done. So Deb and Mike, when are you coming up again? Uh, the weekend. Yeah, we've been up every every weekend. I did I did do a drive-by last weekend and saw that you were there. Stop okay. by. I will. Feel I will. free to stop right. anytime. Yeah. Uh, on the Hawk side, on the Hawk side, can you uh, rally other people uh, in your area? Yes. I know a couple of people uh, and I'll try reaching out we've to them already, too. We've already started talking to people. They're all in. And, and the other part is we talk about the lake all the time, but we forget all the people that are on the on the river that uh, goes into right. the lake. They really get impacted. And, you know, you know, you see all these people doing all their work on their houses and they're not realizing they're losing all that waterfront. But the, right. but the volume of people are on the mountain. And that's where we think we can uh, we can get some financial they, support. They have, I'll tell you, though, Hawk has its own set of issues. Yes, we know. <laughs> which is going to distract from, and there's people who are, it's it's a whole episode. 
So I think that's going to be a challenge, but if people are really smart, they're going to understand that preserving a natural resource, it's going to preserve the value of their properties and their enjoyment and why they bought a house here is going to be more important. Yeah, so, I mean, Hawks access to Amherst once it's gone will never be replaced. Completely. Exactly right. And it's, it's to me, it trumps the, the real estate problem they have with the end, but not everybody will agree with that. So, you know, we'll do our best. Yeah, let's get together. Let's get together, have coffee, everybody. I'll talk to everybody and... Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye, guys. Uh, thank you Peter. Uh, thank you all. Is he still on or is he gone? <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Alicia, take care. Bye. Uh, happy New Year, everybody. Bye. Bye. Great, great Bye. progress. Appreciate Bye. the conversation. Long, long way to go. Long way. Glad you better stop in the police station again. <laughs> <laughs> take care. Yeah. Bye. Oh, I sign off for this now. End meeting for all.